Thank you for joining Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our 2019 Webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday. You can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are, com all are complimentary. If you have questions for our speaker today, you can email them directly at the contact information you'll see on the, the last slide. All right, just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C. based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us there. This is an upcoming event that you can find more information here on our website. And we do offer advertising, so you can reach out to this email if you'd like more information on that. Thank you, Maria and Michael, for joining us today. And they're going to be covering CPARs, contractor claims, and remedies. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you guys. Thank you, Mallory. And thanks again to everybody out there joining us today. Um, this is the second part of a, a two-part webinar that we were doing today, um, all about CPARs. So this second piece, contractor claims and remedies, the idea is to talk about some of the advanced rights and remedies contractors have when dealing with unfair uh, past performance evaluation in CPARs. Um, for those of you who missed the first section, we're gonna do a, a real brief recap. But before we get into that, I just wanna explain a little bit about who we are and uh, you know why we have some a, a substantial knowledge base with regard to, to CPARs and contractor remedies. Um, my name is Maria Panicelli. I'm here with my colleague, Michael Richard. Uh, we are both attorneys in the government contracting practice group at Obermeyer, Redwin, Maxwell, and Hipple. Uh, it's a full-service law firm, but Michael and I focus exclusively on federal government contracting, uh, and that means we help clients navigate the rules and regulations governing federal procurement. That includes bid protests, performance and compliance counseling, subcontractor issues, small business procurement, and finally, most relevant to, to this second piece of our webinar today, we assist clients with dispute resolution vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. That includes drafting and negotiation of requests for equitable adjustment and claims, as well as claims appeal litigation before the Boards of Contract Appeal and the Court of Federal Claims. So it's that last piece that's most relevant to this webinar, as we're going to discuss uh, today in just a minute. Claims are one way that you might ultimately be able to resolve a negative CPARs that was given to you but was not justified or you feel was unfair if, uh, you know, just commenting as set forth in the CPAR system itself was not adequate. Next slide, please. So as I said, this is part two of a two-part series. We covered in the first webinar um, that we just finished up the what, when, who, and how of CPARS evaluations um, that was entitled what's included and what's, what's I'm sorry, CPARS what's included and what if it's wrong. Um, but just for those of you who weren't able to partake, I'm going to give a brief bullet point rundown. Uh, CPAR stands for Contract for Performance Assessment Reporting System. It's actually at a website, cpars.gov. That website is considered the official source for past performance information. Government officials use multiple sources of information when making award decisions, but agencies are specifically instructed to use CPARs to create and measure the quality and timely, I'm um, sorry, create, measure the quality and timely reporting of performance information. So in other words, what's in the CPARs really affects your ability to get future awards Past performance is a big evaluation factor in many procurements for the government. So it's really important to know what's in your CPARs, uh, what, what you've been rated, whether you agree with the ratings, and what to do about it if you think that you got ratings that were, uh, you know, unfairly negative or, you know, kind of worse than you should have gotten. Next slide, please. Michael talks in our last section about what should be evaluated, um, but just to recap at a minimum, they're going to be evaluating the uh, technical, the cost control, schedule timeliness, management or business relations, small business contracting compliance, uh, and they, these evaluation factors might include sub-factors. So what do you do when you get an unfair CPARS evaluation? Uh, you submit comments. You say that you do not concur, and we talked about that in our last presentation. But what if that's not enough? What if once you submit comments, and what if once it goes up to the next level of review, you're still not getting the remedy that you need. There's still no resolution. There's still a few parts out there with some negative comments or some negative ratings about you that you think are unjustified, unfair, illegitimate, et cetera. Um, and obviously that's going to impact your ratings going forward. Uh, I'm sorry, it should impact your ability to get an award going forward. 
um, based on negative ratings. So good news for those of you sitting out there today. You are in a post-Todd construction world. Um, prior to this Todd construction kind of family of cases and, and some other cases that were on similar grounds, there were a, a lot less uh, ways in which you could remedy the situation. There weren't as many re remedies. You didn't have as much recourse to try to correct a negative evaluation. Uh, the Todd construction cases were kind of a series of cases that set the law um, in, kind of set the law in place and changed a lot of things, changed the status quo regarding CPARs and contractors' rights and remedies to correct what they thought were unfair CPARs. So prior to that, there were a couple different jurisdictional battles regarding, you know, who, if anyone, what ju jurisdictional body um, had the, the ability to consider disputes over performance evaluation ratings. Um, there were cases where people tried to challenge ratings before the GAO. Um, basically what that ultimately ended up uh, resulting in was a decision that said the GAO would not hear any direct challenges to the ratings and CPAR. Um, there were also cases where people tried to challenge them in federal district court. That didn't go anywhere either. So finally, what happened is there was this line of cases that established that challenges to performance evaluations fell within the purview of the Contract Disputes Act, the CDA. And the CDA is the statute that governs claims of against the government. Um, in Todd, the court, uh, the, the contractor, submitted a CDA claim asserting that it had received an erroneous performance evaluation, uh, and then it kind of followed that claim, like the way we're going to talk about in just a second, up to the litigation level. The court concluded that the challenge did constitute a claim within the meaning of the Contract Disputes Act, and that therefore the court had jurisdiction of what amounted to a non-monetary dispute. The court said it had jurisdiction to hear a challenge to the performance rating case. Next slide, please. So what that means is there were some jurisdictional hurdles cleared. Uh, like I said, there was that first Todd construction case at the Court of Federal Claims in 2008, holding that the FAR entitled the contractor to a fair and accurate performance evaluation. There was also another case in 2008, the LR group, held that contractors were legally entitled to a fair and accurate performance evaluation pursuant to the FAR. Um, what ended up happening is those Todd decisions ended up being a long and winding road for the contractor trying to actually recover uh, and get some, some remedies. There was Todd 1, Todd 2, Todd 3, et cetera, and I won't bore you with the details of those. Um, now, I will say, sadly, because the contractor in that particular circumstance failed to maybe satisfy some legal procedural requirements, their individual case went nowhere for them, which was obviously bad news for Todd Construction. But it is good news for all of you because it did set a precedent. Um, it went up to the federal circuit, and at the federal circuit in 2011, um, the, the court confirmed that the FAR provided a cause of action to contractors because it was intended to directly and significantly benefit contractors. So what that means is there is now established cause of action, a way to challenge CPARs beyond the comment stage. If that doesn't work, if the comments don't work, you can challenge before a judicial body. You can go to the Court of Federal Claims, as we had on the last slide, or as you can see on this slide, you can go to the Board of Contract Appeals. Um, and there was a case that talked about that up on the screen, 2010. Now, in either case, um, whether you're talking about potentially going to the Court of Federal Claims or going to the Board of Contract Appeals, the issue here is that these jurisdictional bodies, or I'm sorry, these ju judicial bodies have jurisdiction under the Contract Disputes Act, the CDA which, as I said, is the statute that deals with claims. So if you're talking about under, you know, going to either of these bodies under the CDA, there are requirements that you exhaust administrative remedies before seeking judicial help. In other words, you can't just file a complaint before the Court of Federal Claims or a complaint before the Board of Contract Appeals. You need to file a claim with the agency first. Uh, that requires that you file it with the agency and that you get a contracting officer's final decision or if the government fails to provide a contracting officer's final decision within a timely frame. Only then may it be appealed to the Court of Federal Claims or the Board of Contract Appeals. Now, it's important to understand the claim has to be submitted after the CPAR has been closed by the reviewing official. The comments enough are not enough to trigger uh, this exhaustion. So in other words, Yes, you definitely should be making comments and disagreeing with anything that you think is unjust, uh, you know, putting into the CPARs that you do not concur, as we talked about in our last presentation. But that is not the same as a quote-unquote claim. You have to file a separate claim, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, and pass that through to, to exhaust these administrative remedies and get kind of the, 
the door opened to going to the Court of Federal Claims or the Board of Contract Appeals. Next slide, please. So what about the claim itself? Um, like any claim under the, the CDA, under the Contract Disputes Act, you have six years to file. Um, and we see a lot of times when you're dealing with other types of claims that people might wait six years to file or wait close to six years to file. Um, but obviously when you're talking about CPARs, for all the reasons that CPARs are important, they're affecting your past performance ratings, that's impacting your ability to get additional jobs, uh, it might be limiting your contract opportunities, you're going to want to file quicker than that. You're going to probably want to file as quickly as possible. So you have six years, but best practices, you want to get it in and try to get this resolved as quickly as possible so that your past performance rating is, um, you know, not negatively affected. Now, once you have the contracting officer's final decision, you have uh, the ability to appeal, as I said, either to the board of the contract, I'm sorry, the board of contract appeal or the court of federal claims. Appeals to the court of federal claim must be made within one year of the contracting officer's final decision on your claim. There's a shorter time frame to appeal to the boards of contract appeals. And for those of you who aren't aware, which board you go to is going to depend on what agency you're dealing with. There's the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals. There's the Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. Um, and you need to make an appeal to one of those within 90 days of receiving a contracting officer's final decision. Uh, historically, the boards had denied to take jurisdiction of performance evaluation claims, um, but that has changed, again, with the case that we had up on the screen before, Verser. There's also a case called Colonist Shipyard, for those of you who are, are interested, which basically expanded the practices in Verser by indicating that a breach of the, good, uh, of the duty of good faith and fair dealing may provide a sufficient relationship to, uh, to support a claim. And Michael's going to talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, the Federal Circuit's rationale in Todd Construction, remember those Todd Construction cases that we talked about, seems to extend to the Board of Contract Appeals as well, so you can go either place. Next slide, please. Now, what do you actually want to put in the claim itself? What is required to appeal an unfair CPARS? You have to file, like I said, a claim that meets the requirements of the Contract Disputes Act. Um, that means it has to be in writing, has to be submitted to the contracting officer before appeal, must request a contracting officer's final decision, and it must state the relief sought. In terms of what you're doing in this particular context, those are the, the requirements for all CDA claims. But when you're talking about a CPR, a CPAR claim in particular, uh, you're going to want to identify the substantive defects in the CPARs, as well as procedural defects if there are any. Uh, although the statute of limitations to bring the claim is six years, again, you want to do that as soon as possible because the negative impact of a CPAR can be pretty important. Um, the claim should demand a decision within 60 days. If no decision is issued within that time frame, you can do what's called a deemed denial. Now, in terms of the standard of review, this is something that, you know, the government needs to be aware of. The government is the one that's going to have to know what standard they're reviewing things by. But like with anything, if you know what your audience is looking for, if you know what, how the audience is going to be evaluating something, it's of value to you. So I think uh, what is of value to contractors is to understand that the way the government is going to look at a claim based on CPARs is to evaluate under two distinct sets of requirements. Uh, were the requisite procedures followed, and was this a fair and accurate performance evaluation? Procedural errors are going to be reviewed de novo. In other words, they're not going to give any discretion to the, the person who performed the review. And in order to provide, excuse me, avoid problems with standing and redressability, the complaint should be tied specifically back to procedural flaws that prejudice the evaluation. Substantive errors are going to be reviewed, and they're going to be looking for abuse of discretion. You need to be able to show that there was arbitrary or capricious conduct by the government. You need to show that there was some sort of illegitimacy or unjustified nature of their comments. The fact that you disagree with their comments isn't going to be enough. This is going to be an abuse of discretion type standard, um, and you're going to have to show whether your shortcomings were actually excusable, um, whether the government shared in the fault, whether the government maybe ignored or misstated excuse me, significant facts or metrics, whether the government held the contractor to requirements beyond the scope of their actual contract. Maybe there were factors outside of contract performance that influenced the ratings, like bias or you know, a third party. Uh, has the contractor, I'm sorry, has the government identified a serious event and an impact to the government? Or is this just kind of something that they latched onto and feel negatively about? Those are going to be the things that are evaluated when kind of evaluating whether or not the CPARS was justified or fair 
or whether it's, uh, you know, an abuse of discretion. Next slide, please. So, next slide, please. Okay, I think this goes over to Michael. Yes. Thanks, Maria. So, uh, as Maria mentioned, we're, we're both government contracting attorneys um, here at Overmar. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about what remedies you can get through filing a claim for, C for an unfair CPARS. Uh, the first remedy that is universally available from both the board and the courts is a declaratory judgment. A declaratory judgment is just what it sounds like. It's a declaration from the court that says the CPARS was unfair and inaccurate. Um, it won't change the CPARS in the system. Uh, it's, so it's not really an ideal remedy because it doesn't get rid of the bad review that shows up in the CPAR system when future procuring officials go and, and look for your past performance information. However, uh, it does tend to help you when addressing that negative CPARs with those procuring officials. Uh, we've seen situations where uh, a contractor will obtain a declaratory judgment stating that the CPARS was unfair and inaccurate and will attach it as part of his proposal every time he submits, every time he submitted a uh, proposal for a new procurement so that anybody who went back and looked at that, at that CPARS evaluation would know that a judge had ruled that it wasn't accurate. Um, the contractor is definitely better off having the declaration than not, but it's far from a complete remedy. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, so, the board, uh, the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals and the Versailles decision that Maria mentioned specifically ruled that the ASPCA does not have jurisdiction to grant specific performance or injunctive relief. Uh, the Court of Federal Claims also does not have jurisdiction under the CDA to provide injunctive or equitable relief. So, what does that mean? Uh, specific performance or injunctive relief is an order from the court telling the government what rating to apply, telling the government what to do specifically. Uh, the boards and the courts will not order a contracting officer to enter a specific rating. I've asked both board judges and COFC judges to do that in, in the context of settlement negotiations and things like that, uh, and both have refused categorically citing these cases and saying they just don't have jurisdiction to make that kind of order. That said, uh, We'll get into settlements a little bit later on, and I will tell you that, that the judges tend to be very unfriendly to government arguments that they can't change the ratings. Um, so there is no claim that will result in a court order to adjust the ratings in the CPA, or, uh, evaluation to give you a specific rating that you're looking for. Next slide, please. However, the Court of Federal Claims does have jurisdiction to remand the evaluation to the agency for reconsideration. Um, the remand, the, the Court of Federal Claims said in side construction, the remand does not mandate a particular factual determination that directs the agency's attention to matters the court believes require further action to create an accurate, the adequate record for the agency's decision. In other words, what the court is saying to the agency in this situation is, we've identified these defects in the evaluation that you gave to this contractor. Go back and redo the evaluation, keeping in mind what we thought was wrong with it and what made it unfair and inaccurate. Uh, usually we find it, this, this is a pretty good outcome for the contractor. It's, it's not perfect, but usually what we find is that the remanded agency will do its best to do an honest reassessment of the contractor's performance taking into account the issues that the court raised with the original evaluation. Um, it's very easy for the agency to go back and say, you know what, the court dinged us on these three items, we're going to go ahead and give better ratings on those because it, it clearly what didn't pass judicial review and it wasn't accurate. Um, however, sometimes the agency will simply reissue the same evaluation with new justifications that just attempt to evade the issues that the court brought up and evade, re evade giving any sort of better evaluation in the categories that the court identified was problematic. So while a remand for reconsideration is a positive outcome, it may not get you the result that you're looking for 
because the agency may just turn around and try and find a way to justify the original evaluation that they gave you. Um, and if they address the issues that the court brings up, the court may not remand it for reevaluation a second time. Next slide, please. So you may have grasped that there's a running theme here that most of these most of these remedies really aren't ideal. Getting a declaration from the court is great, but doesn't get rid of the CPARs in the system. Getting the court to order a remand for reconsideration is great, but doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a fair evaluation the second time around. So what can you really do? Well, there is a new type of claim out there. Uh, to my knowledge, no one has actually won one of these yet. But uh, an appeal of Government Services Corporation, the contractor brought this claim and the government moved to dismiss it, and the uh, Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals rejected the government's motion to dismiss, and the government eventually settled the claim. So what this tells us is that contractors can bring this type of claim. So how does this work? The contractor received a CPARS review that it believed was unfair and inaccurate, and filed a claim for $100,000 in estimated damages. Uh, the estimate was not based on future profits from lost work, and that's a really important point. Contractors who, bring, who come to me frequently will say, I got a terrible CPARS, it's gonna cost me all these contracts, I'm gonna lose millions of dollars in lost profits that I would have gotten from these future contracts. I wanna claim for that. You can't generally claim lost profits against the government. It's just not available under the applicable case law. So it, it, it's a dead issue to try and go after that. What you can claim for is your estimated cost to address the unfavorable review when submitting for future proposals. So what's it gonna cost you in terms of administrative and legal support to address that? What's it gonna cost you to go have meetings with the procuring officials and explain to them why that CPARS is unfair? What's it gonna cost you to hire lawyers to write letters explaining that that CPARS is unfair. Uh, those are hard costs, they're not lost profits, and they, they can be estimated, and you can say, we think it's gonna cost us 100,000, we think it's gonna cost us a million dollars, given the number, it all depends on the number of proposals that you're likely to submit within the, the period of time the CPARS will remain visible in the system, uh, which, for those of you who don't know, the CPARS is supposed to remain in the system for six years following the date of contract award. Uh, we have seen situations where it appears that the CPAR lingered longer, but it's supposed to be removed from, that contract is supposed to be removed from the CPAR system six years after the date automatically. And for the most part, it does seem to function that way. Um, so next slide, please. So in uh, the Appeal of Government Services Corporation, uh, as I said, the government moved to dismiss the claim on the basis that it failed to state any sum certain. Um, they said you couldn't just use an estimate. The board rejected this argument. It said it's perfectly legitimate to use an estimate of your future cost. Uh, the litigation was allowed to proceed. Like I said, there were no further filings. There, were no, uh, there was no board decision on this. So we don't know for sure that anybody's ever won one of these but the case did settle. So my strong suspicion is, is that these sorts of claims are going to be important going forward because most of the time the government is not going to be willing to risk having monetary damages assessed against it in order to stick by a defective CPARS review. Uh, we all know that sometimes when you point out that a government official has done something a little bit unfair, like give you a bad performance review that wasn't unjustified, Sometimes they will circle the wagons and say, no, nope, everything we did was right. We're not going to change anything. It, that tends to change when they have a very real threat in front of them of having to pay money for doing the, that unfair action. So what these claims really do, uh, you shouldn't expect that you're going to get a whole bunch of money as a result of this claim, but you should expect that this can be a great tool to uh, provide incentive for the government to reassess your evaluation and give you a fair CPARS. Um, next slide, please. So finally, I want to talk about something that does come up an awful lot, and that's CPARs and settlements. Uh, in our last presentation, Maria mentioned this, this section on what the standard is 
for uh, the government to evaluate your performance. It's set forth in FAR 42.1503B. The evaluation should include a clear non-technical description of the principal purpose of the contractor order. Evaluation should reflect how the contractor performed. Evaluation should include clear, relevant information that accurately depicts the contractor's performance and be based on objective facts supported by program and contractor order performance data. The evaluation should be tailored to the contract type, size, content, and complexity, the contractual requirements. So there's nothing in here that specifically says the government can't change an evaluation or a rating uh, as part of a settlement. Um, what we frequently hear from the government during mediations and settlement negotiations is that this is supposed to be an objective rating, here's the standard, we're not going to change it on the basis of what we've arrived at in a settlement to resolve your claims. Um, what we have pointed out to them successfully in the past is that often the bad rating relates to issues that were addressed in the claims. So, for example, I had a situation where uh, the contractor had received an unsatisfactory on schedule but had brought a claim for several hundred days of delay that was government caused. When the government admitted li essentially admitted liability through the settlement process and gave the contract to the time extension and then said, we're not going to change the CPARs. And we pointed out, you know, that's not fair. These delays that you pointed to in this CPARs rating that said that they didn't do a good job on schedule, those delays were entirely uh, dealt with by the claim. And you awarded us extra days and you awarded us extra money. You should change the CPARs accordingly. And I can tell you that the judge who was mediating that dispute was definitely not friendly to the government's argument that they couldn't change the rating. Um, so for government personnel who may be listening, I, I would just encourage you to keep in mind, ratings can be changed as part of settlement. We can have the next slide, please. There's simply no statutory basis for the government to refuse to make a fair CPARS evaluation as part of a settlement. Uh, they do need to, it does need to be objectively accurate, so you shouldn't ask government personnel to put something in there that's not true, but you can certainly get them, you can certainly point out that issues that are resolved as part of the claims process and part of the settlement process uh, should not support a negative CPARS rating. And with that, we are done. Uh, if we could go to the next slide for contact information. If you have any questions, you can reach us. Again, I'm Michael Richard, here with my colleague, Maria Panicelli, uh, who is the chair of our government contracting group. Uh, you can reach Maria at maria.panicelli at overmeyer.com. You can reach me at michael.richard at overmeyer.com. Uh, please feel free to give us a call, send us an email. If you have any questions about CPARS, we're always happy to uh, give you a free consultation. And also, one thing to add, we have a, a blog, GovCon Examiner. Um, that you can find at govconexaminer.com, um, and we post regularly, uh, usually at least weekly, on important updates with government contracting issues like CPARs or you know anything that comes up regarding claims, bid protests, small business procurement, et cetera. So feel free to check us out there and follow along or shoot us an email, give us a call if you've got questions. Uh, thank you to Jennifer Sars and Associates for hosting us. Thank you to all of you out there for attending, and with that, we'll pass it back to Mallory. Thank you so much, Maria and Michael, for sharing your knowledge and insight today. Um, like they said, if you have any questions, please contact them directly with the contact information you see on your screen. And that concludes the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.